Okay. Um, can you tell me about what led to you finally deciding that it was time to go? That Death Row was not going to be the place that to put your music out, basically, that, that it wasn't going to happen, and what led to that decision? Well, I can't get too deep into it, but I will tell you that some things happened in my city, you know what I'm saying? And um, it was just like, yo, life is unpredictable. We don't know how much time we got here. You know what I'm saying? And uh, after that happened, I was like, yo, man, I need to really make this music thing happen. And I don't know if it's going to happen on this label because I've been here for four years. And, you know, it seems like they're putting up roadblocks for sure. You know, I felt like the unseen forces of the music industry were plotting to keep him from being able to flourish. And that would trickle down and affect me as an artist. Because if he can't flourish, I can't flourish. You know what I'm saying? So, I, throughout that four years, things were happening, whatever, you know. But a certain incident went down. And after that incident, it kind of changed me. And I said, yo, I got to I gotta go chase this dream down a little harder. Or else I'm going to end up a statistic. So it was time to go. You know what I'm saying? It was time to go because when I look into my kids' eyes, I got to be the one to protect their future. I got to be the one to make sure that I leave them with something. You know what I mean? I got to be the one to make sure that they got everything they need. And the only way that I want to do that is with music. You, you know what I mean? I could do it in other ways, but the way that I want to do it is with music. So it was just that time for me to just go ahead and pack it up. You know what I mean? And go see what I can make happen. You know what I'm saying? Because, like I said, rapping till you was 30 back then, that was a joke. We was like, ain't nobody rapping till they 30 years old. You know what I'm saying? So I got to go. And I got to use these last years of mine and my youth to make something huge happen that will change my life and my family's life. That's, that's what the decision was about. Okay. And then from Death Row, you start working with um, Joe Israel at Treacherous. Can you tell me how you got that deal and how that went down um yo so i didn't even know joe was over there you know what i'm saying a couple of the couple of the the, the the owners of that label well the owner and his brother you know they did time with joe you feel me so when they got out they was like yo we want to do a label and one of the brothers was like, yo, we need to get at Crook. That's the hardest motherfucker on the West. So I was like, somebody called me. It was like, hey, man, there's some guys out here that are really interested in doing some stuff with you. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, okay. So I, let me go see what they're talking about. And when I got there, Joe was there. He was like the vice president or something. And I already knew Joe. You know what I'm saying? Because Joe was instrumental in putting out that record we spoke about earlier. Uh-oh. You know what I'm saying? He was instrumental in my career back when I was a teenager, 19 years old, you know, 17, 18, 19. So I already knew Joe. Um, I had already met him. I didn't say I knew him. I had already met him, and we had talked and, you know, things of that nature. So when I got there, you know, Joe Iskro, the old man, you know what I mean? If if anybody know about his history, then they know what I'm talking about. He uh he was like, "Yo, crook, it's been some years," and I was like, "Yeah, man." And you know, 
mafioso style, you know, covering his mouth while he talking outside, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we like, he like, yeah, man, your reputation is impeccable, man. He was like, I call around and call around and it seems like nobody has anything bad to say about you. And I said, well, that's a good thing, you know, and uh, I said, that's a high compliment coming from you. I'm trying to keep it that way. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, come on over here. And then he did something that was really impressive. I had a guy with me and I ain't going to say his name. But as soon as I went to the bathroom, he tried to get side deals cracking. You ever took somebody into a business meeting with you and they're just there? And then they're such an opportunist that as soon as you go to the bathroom, they try to get their own little deal cracking with the people that have. This is not what the meeting is for. And Joe told me, he pulled me to the side. He said, hey, that guy that's with you, I wouldn't be around him too much longer because he tried to get us to sign three other artists instead of you. Hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. But I felt him on that. And I say, like, all right, cool. And then, you know, the owner, the homie Tico, me and him connected right away. We start talking and we just sat down in the office for like an hour, cracking jokes and laughing. And I connected with him, you know what I'm saying? And uh, next thing you know, we was doing treacherous records, you know? And like I said, I learned so much of the industry at death row. And, after, and then it, before I got to treacherous, you know what I mean? I was doing, I was doing other stuff in the independent world. So I had got so much knowledge that they was like, yo, we want to give you an executive role here. And that was my first time having an executive role at a label. You know what I'm saying? And um, I, I had to sign off on people that they signed. A lot of people didn't know that, though, because I didn't want it to be known. Because when you're an artist, it's a lot of competition in the building. So I didn't want them to think that just because I was an artist, I was not trying to support their projects as, as other artists on the roster. So... They didn't know for a long time that I was, you know what I'm saying, an executive over there. Um, but we ended up, you know what I'm saying, signing J.O. Felony to, a, to an album deal. Rest in peace, Big Psych. You know what I'm saying? We signed Nocturnal. K. Young, you know what I'm saying? 1-2, my man 1-2. And uh, yeah, Tico, man, the CEO, he's just a real dude, man. He's just a real dude. And um, I still talk to him to this day. You know what I'm saying? I still talk to him to this day, man. It's just a solid, solid individual. And we just, you know, we was just independent, man, trying to make it happen. Flying out to Miami, doing studio sessions with Scott Storch. You know what I'm saying? At the Hit Factory. You know what I mean? Getting treated like pieces of shit at the Trump Towers. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was a good time. I was in there, you know, Paris Hilton at... Uh, Timberland and Puff and all of you know, we was just in there making music, man. And I that's I actually I saw Irv uh while I was there too, doing all that. I saw Irv in Miami, man, and somebody said, Joe, crook right here. I had a table next to him. And somebody in his entourage was like, he ain't on the road no more, don't give him no love. And Irv was like, man. I love this young dude right here. I don't care about that, man. I love Shug. I love the road. I love Crook. It's all good. Crook, what's happening? You know what I'm saying? And I just heard it. And I was like, yo, what's up, Irv? You know what I mean? And and I, I, I let it register that this dude's pretty solid right here. Because, you know, that's not his, that's not his, uh, anything, you know? It's just people go to different labels. Um, but yeah, man. Treacherous was really good. I mean, that's where I started the Hip Hop Weekly series at, the, you know, the series that changed it all. I kind of changed the way that people digest music today. I gave out a free song every day. I mean, every week, once a week for a whole year. I dropped a free song once a week for a whole year. And I changed the way that hip hop digested music because that was unheard of back then. Back then, you would do a mixtape and then an album. That was it. You would go away for a year and you would come back the next year. I was hitting them once a week. I was the first one to ever do that. I innovated that whole pattern and it got me to the cover of Double XL, got me on the cover of some other magazines. And it started a trend to where, you know, Kanye did, you know, Good Music Mondays. I mean, all the artists followed that trend that I set because they saw how successful I was with it. 
they saw that every time they turned around, because this is the music blog era, so they saw every time they turned around, my face was on that front page of the most poppinest blogs once a week. And they was like, yo, we don't understand why he's dropping all this free music once a week, but we got to jump in because now it's the, making the fans develop an appetite for more music. And I'm sorry that I made, I, I kind of, um, I kind of contributed to the microwave generation that we got right now. The shortage is bad and all that kind of shit. I kind of I kind of contributed to it because I changed the trajectory of dropping music once a week. And people were like, yo, I can handle mu new music once a week. And that's what they started wanting from their favorite artists. And so their favorite artists started doing it. You know what I'm saying? And they give me my credit for it, you know, behind the scenes, of course. Yo, man, yo, your weekly series inspired me to do it weekly, too, you know. And, I, you know, they tell me, you know what I'm saying? But, um, yeah, innovating that, all that happened at Treacherous Records, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's another chapter in my life. Um, it's a classic series. So anybody say, you know, whenever you, did, did you ever drop a Blueprint? Did you ever drop an Illmatic? I dropped a weekly series. I changed the way music was digested on a weekly basis. I took the blog era to another level. It took me all around the world. It put me on the cover of Double XL magazine, and it paid me every time I did the shows. So I made money off of it. I had a huge impact off of it. I set a trend with it. That's all the things that classic albums do, right? So I might not have a classic album in some people's opinion, but that series is hands down classic no matter what nobody say. You know what I mean? So that happened over there. So I had all this. I, I worked with Tupac at Death Row. You know what I mean? I learned game from Suge. I got my checks on time from Reggie. You feel me? I went to Treacherous. I did the weekly series. You feel me? We still got another down there 18, 17 years, bro. We, we still got 17 years that we need to catch up on. We ain't even talked about it. half the other shit. That's why I got these grays in my beard, Reggie. 